From propeller planes to jets, it transformed how we travel. From oven baked to micro zapped, changed how we eat. And from adding machine to laptop, changed the way we think. They're all inventions of the 1940s. A decade shaken and inspired by the demands of war. From the computer to the jet engine to the crash test dummy, they're the inventions that shook the world. It was the roar that revolutionized travel, blasting us higher, faster, farther than ever before. The jet engine made it possible to circle the planet in a single day. And it all happened because a small boy had a very big dream. Coventry, England, during World War I, Seven-year-old Frank Whittle is obsessed with machines and how they work. Then he sees something that will focus his brilliant mind for the rest of his life. A plane crashes in his own backyard. From that moment on, his obsession takes flight. He dreams of joining the Royal Air Force. And as soon as he's old enough, he applies. He was very short, uh, about five feet tall, and quite thin at the time. And the story is that he tried a couple of times and was rejected. Frank Whittle is stubborn and persistent. The RAF finally lets him in. He was recognized as a really talented pilot but is also a pilot who would push the limit and doing all sorts of things that you weren't supposed to do. Whittle takes chances, logging hundreds of flight hours at top speeds, pushing his plane and its propeller to the max. By the time you get into the 1930s and toward World War II, propellers, they were being pushed close to their ultimate limit. If a pilot pushes the aircraft to speeds approaching 800 kilometers per hour, Shock waves will rip the prop apart. Whittle recognized that it was time for a radical departure, just for a completely new kind of, of engine. Whittle's inventor brain goes into overdrive. He realizes that to make planes fly faster, they'll have to fly higher, where the air is thinner, reducing drag on the aircraft. And of course, when you do that, there's a problem with uh, engines not getting enough oxygen at higher altitudes and propellers not having enough air to bite into at higher altitudes. Whittle's conclusion, the propeller has to go. A whole new kind of propulsion system is needed. He was invited to talk to one of the great aeronautical scientists in Britain, A.A. Griffiths. To get his idea past the blueprint stage, Whittle needs Griffiths and the rest of the British government on side. I have here plans for a new type of propulsion system that will give us speeds... A propulsion system he calls the jet engine. The engine relies on a fan to suck in air from the front, then compresses the air in a combustion chamber, sprays it with fuel and ignites it. Whittle believes the burning gases will blast the plane forward at speeds of up to 960 kilometers per hour. Pull air in the front, hot gases come out the back, and uh, it's just simplicity itself. The young inventor is sure his idea is ready for takeoff. If only he can get support and financing from Griffiths. But the senior engineer brings Whittle crashing back to Earth. Impressive. It'll never work. Griffiths tells him no metal is strong enough to withstand the intense heat generated in the combustion chambers. The engine will melt. So what he said was maybe in the future, but not right now. 
But Whittles faced skeptics before. It just makes him more determined. He raises private money and spends the next eight years trying to perfect his engine and build a prototype. One of the reasons that the early people who heard him talk about the jet engine were sometimes negative or cautionary was the fact that they were smart engineers and knew what the problems were. And here comes this guy who literally is ahead of his time and sees challenges instead of problems and uh, pushes, pushes, pushes. By the spring of 1937, he's ready for his first full-scale engine test a decade's work riding on the flip of a switch. The engine revs out of control. There was too much fuel in the combustion chamber. Whittle barely manages to shut it down and prevent a disaster. What's worse, it looks like his work might be for nothing because a rival nation is putting a lot of effort into perfecting the jet engine. In Germany, the government became, becomes hugely interested in jets pretty early on. They're just interested in cutting edge stuff. They're willing to invest in it. Hitler makes the jet engine a top military priority. The Germans install their own jet engine prototype in a fighter plane, the Heinkel HE-178. And on August 27th, 1939, they test it. The engine died. It was only a flight of six minutes. That was it. They're forced to land because the Germans also haven't found a strong enough metal to withstand the heat of a jet engine. The German jet engine isn't all that's heating up. The following month, Hitler invades Poland and plunges Europe into war. And the British government now realize that this is something worth investing in. And it's how they spend their money and what they do with it uh, that counts. The money Frank Whittle has needed for more than a decade is now flowing. He's put in charge of a crack team of Britain's finest engineers. And metal manufacturers are now racing to invent a material that can withstand super high temperatures. Whittle tended to look at those problems and see them as challenges that he could overcome. Uh, but these more experienced engineers were uh, less sure than, uh, than Frank Whittle was. It was one of his great advantages. The all-out effort pays off. Scientists come up with a metal so strong, it's pretty much indestructible. A mixture of nickel, chrome, steel, and molybdenum. Now, Whittle prepares for the ultimate test. April 11th, 1941. That's Frank Whittle in the cockpit of a British warplane, the Gloucester Pioneer, doing a preliminary ground test. The next day, he stays on the ground to observe his invention in action. Will his new, improved jet engine survive its first flight? Seventeen minutes later, a triumphant touchdown. Whittle's engine has blown away the competition with no signs of overheating. The invention of the jet engine is the great turning point right in the middle of the history of the airplane. And it is a radical change in the history of how we fly. And its real impact on the world, on the way you and I live our lives, is the fact that the jet age meant air transportation for everybody. Almost anybody could now afford to fly to see grandma or to go halfway around the world on a vacation or whatever you wanted to do. Frank Whittle has faced extraordinary obstacles to reach this day. But there's one thing he never doubted. 
the science that fueled his idea. After it landed, one of the other people who was there said to Whittle, well, Frank, it flew. And Whittle's response was, well, that's bloody well what it was supposed to do. Other inventions of the decade. 1942, super glue. An unexpected eureka moment for a chemist who'd been trying to invent a clear plastic. 1943, scuba diving, pioneered by a French resistance fighter who braved the deep to locate German mines. Also in 1943, the slinky, invented by an engineer who watched a spring fall off a shelf and wiggle like a worm. Everyone wants a slinky, you want to get a slinky. Picture a world before bits and bytes, where the work done by all these computers had to be calculated manually by humans, where the frustration of it all drove one man to invent the world's first electronic brain. This is Konrad Zusa, science nerd and inventor of the future. But in 1935, He's just another engineer in Berlin, trying to get ahead and get along with his colleagues. Problem is, he's got a sharp mind, and he's easily bored. As a student, my father studied at the same university where I'm working. The name was at this time Technische Hochschule Charlottenburg. And there he started machine construction, then it was boring for him. Then he changed to architecture. It was boring for him. At the Heinkel Aircraft Company, he does endless math equations to calculate the effect of wind on airplane wings. But the adding machines of the day aren't exactly user-friendly. Everything has to be inputted by hand. The monotony is making Zusa crazy, and he's driving his colleagues up the wall. These calculations were horrible for him. And he thought about, at this time, he thought about, how can I make it easier? Zusa figures he can't be alone in his hatred of the adding machine. He's pretty sure there's a whole country out there that would love a machine that can do complex calculations without having to input every tiny detail by hand. He saw a market in Germany at this time, and he thought, everyone needs such a machine, and then I can get rich. Zeus's idea becomes an obsession. He quits his job and moves in with mom to work on it full time. Came to his parents and said, I need a living room. I want to build up a big machine which makes uh, mathematical calculations. They have no idea that their son's eccentric tinkering will change the future of the entire planet. Zusa begins work on a machine that will do more than just complex calculations. It can be programmed to actually think for itself. In other words, a computer. But to program it, he needs a language that both man and computer can understand. It dawns on Zusa that the solution lies in an ancient mathematical system called binary. He learns how it uses sequences of ones and zeros to represent numbers similar to Morse code. It's a language so simple even a machine can follow it. The next challenge, how to physically represent these ones and zeros in his machine. Zusa thinks he can do it with thousands of mechanical switches. A sequence of switches turned on or off can represent any number. So he rolls up his sleeves and starts building the switches by hand. He took metal sheets and then he, he took a uh, saw and he made a template and structures. He had about 30,000 metal sheets. 
One by one, Zusa turns these sheets into the thousands of intricate metal switches that will create his binary sequences. Trouble is, if even one switch is out of alignment, none of it works. He has to find a better way. But now, world events threaten to derail his entire project. It's 1939. Konrad Zusa is called up to fight for Hitler. But instead of marching off to the front, Zusa manages to talk his way into a job in aerodynamics with the German Air Force. He tries to convince them to buy into his computer concept. But they don't see any use for it. So Zusa keeps plugging away on his own after work at night. He comes up with a brilliant solution to replace those cumbersome mechanical switches. He salvages electrical relays from old telephones and uses them instead. The relays become the switches that will create his binary sequences. It's a major turning point for Zusa's project. No more clunky moving parts, just the efficient hum of electricity. December 1941, the computer is finished. Six years of work and 2,500 electrical relays waiting to be brought to life. It's a moment of truth. Zusa feeds a complicated mathematical problem into the computer. Within minutes, it delivers the right answer. He's done it. Konrad Zusa has built the world's first fully programmable electronic computer. He uh, had a vision. He constructed a completely new type of calculating machines or computers. Partially, he was really a genius. But there's a war going on and the world's attention is elsewhere. There was no press, there was no sensation, there was no report in any newspaper. After the war, Zusa starts one of the world's first computer companies. Today, Konrad Zusa's binary-based design is the universal standard for every computer in the world. More inventions of the decade 1946, the Air Phibian. A brilliant way to beat rush hour, but the car with wings is so expensive, it never takes flight with consumers. Props are off in 30 seconds. Tail and wings take slightly longer. 1948, Velcro rips onto the scene, thanks to a Swiss engineer who got covered in burrs and realized their tiny hooks had incredible grip. 1945, the atomic bomb. It explodes the boundaries of warfare. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen or get one of these. No flame here, just microwaves of energy to make your meal in minutes discovered by an American who realized it's not about reinventing fire, but replacing it. Percy Spencer is a 50-year-old inventor at the end of World War II with an impressive list of patents to his name. He wants to beat Thomas Edison's record of 1,000 plus patents, a lofty goal for a guy with no formal education. My grandfather grew up in Howland, Maine, and it was a logging community. In fact, his father died when Gramps was 18 months old in a sawmill accident. So he grew up as an orphan, and my grandfather went through sixth grade and then left school and became an apprentice at a local machine shop. And that's as far as his education went. 
Spencer's an orphan by age two, but his rough start in life doesn't dampen his scientific spark. He teaches himself calculus, trigonometry, physics, and works his way into engineering. During the war, he lands a job with Raytheon, the world's leader in radar technology. His design for radar sets helps the Allies detect and blow up enemy subs. That earns him the Navy's highest civilian honor, the achievement of a lifetime for most men, but not Percy Spencer. My grandfather was very competitive with the more elite, well-educated individuals. The story is often told that they had heard that he only had a sixth grade education, so they made him address any letters to them with doctor in front of their name. Spencer's rivalry with his colleagues fuels his determination to leave a lasting mark, an invention everyone will remember. His eureka moment strikes unexpectedly. In the Raytheon lab, he stops in front of a magnetron. Inside the device, a filament gives off electrons. The electrons move outward, coming into contact with a magnetic field. The result, electromagnetic energy. Basically, it's a small series of cavities that electromagnetic energy vibrates in. And much like a whistle, it produces consistent waves that can be used for detecting things with radar. Spencer notices something bizarre. In his pocket, a candy bar has liquefied. He knows body heat can't do that much damage. Could it be the magnetron? Spencer sets up an experiment to test his idea under the curious eye of his Ivy League co-workers. He places some unpopped corn in front of the magnetron. Spencer's hunch is right. Microwaves are agitating the water molecules inside the corn. As molecules bang into each other, they create friction and heat, which turns the water to steam and causes the kernel to explode. His thinking was, gee, if we can melt a candy bar and we can pop some popcorn, maybe we can cook an egg. Spencer's colleague watches in disbelief as the egg begins to shudder with greater and greater intensity. And one of the more skeptical engineers looks over the shield to see, well, is this really cooking? And unfortunately, the egg blew up in his face. So um, I always thought that was the derivation of the expression, egg in one's face. Spencer's experiment reveals something else. Microwaves heat food, but not the containers, because containers don't have water molecules waiting to be zapped. The whole concept of being able to cook without using heat was science fiction. And if you can imagine what it took to convince people to invest in this. To verify his findings, Spencer installs a magnetron inside a metal box. When the microwaves can't escape, their power is concentrated. So food cooks up to eight times faster than in a conventional oven. Percy Spencer has just invented the world's first microwave oven. 20 years and plenty of modifications later, the first countertop model hits the market and the microwave revolution begins. Gramps shared with a lot of inventors the ability to see the unseen, to visualize something that does not yet exist. Well, I recall as a boy having one of the first microwave ovens. It was as large as a refrigerator. You had to let it warm up for 20 minutes before you could cook anything in it. But it would cook 10 times faster than anything you could buy nowadays because it had 10 times more power. It ran off at 220 volts and required plumbing to keep it cool. 
For his achievement, Spencer receives an honorary degree from the University of Massachusetts in 1949. Vindication for a man who started with nothing and a comeuppance for his colleagues. It was a great honor, but he didn't make a big deal about it, except for these individuals who had to, from then on, address any mail to him with the word doctor in front. Percy Spencer never does break Thomas Edison's record, though by the end of his life, he has 150 patents to his name. But it's his contribution to the kitchen that Percy Spencer will always be remembered for. Other hot inventions of the 40s. 1946, the bikini blows away modesty, thanks to a French engineer who'd rather work with bodies than buildings. 1943, Silly Putty stretches the imagination of a scientist who'd been trying to invent synthetic rubber. And 1946, Tupperware makes homemakers want to throw a party, thanks to inventor and marketing whiz, Earl Tupper. Tupperware keeps aroma and flavor locked in. If house cats could turn the competition on its head and give a prize to their favorite human, it might just be the American inventor who revolutionized the way felines do business. World War II has just ended and Ed Lowe has recently returned home from service. A Navy man full of ideas in search of the American dream but he's broke, and in small town Michigan, reality hits hard. When the war was over, Ed Lowe hitchhiked home, and he went to work for his father, and he went home to a wife and small child, so he had responsibility knocking on his door. His dad's business, selling sand and sawdust, products that soak up chemical spills in factories. He went and um, worked for his father's delivery business, and tried to expand that business. Uh, his father had a tavern in Vandalia, and so he wanted really Ed to take over the delivery business, which Ed did very successfully. He expanded the client base, and he also expanded the product lines that they were delivering. But it's a tough living, and Ed doesn't want to be poor forever. He was always looking for another product, always looking for something to do because he was trying to, to bump up his father's business. Ed dreams of capturing new markets with a super absorbent clay called Fuller's Earth. But nobody's interested in his ideas. By January 1947, he's a frustrated man. His neighbor is having a hard time too Kay Draper is trying to dig enough sand so her cat can stay inside on a cold winter's night. But the ground's frozen solid. Ed, hi. She asks Ed if he's got any sawdust. And she was very persistent saying, well, you must have something here that I could use for my cat box. In the 40s, cats are the underdogs of house pets. Fido rules, because dogs can be trained to go outside when nature calls. And there's the odor problem. Cats produce highly concentrated, undiluted waste, because they've evolved from desert creatures that have to conserve water. So the feline of the 40s spends its nights out in the cold. The day Kay comes calling, Ed is trying to find a market for all that Fuller's Earth in his garage. Kay says she'll try anything. Down in Kay's basement, Caesar investigates the new substance and gets right down to business. The first deposit in a billion dollar industry. Turns out Fuller's Earth is a geological wonder. 
It was formed more than 200 million years ago. Volcanic ash was buried and compressed under seawater and silt, so its chemical composition changed. The result? Extremely fine particles, each packing an electrical charge that attracts and binds other molecules, making Fuller's Earth super absorbent. Fuller's Earth clay, because of its absorbency, allowed the, the uh, the urine from a cat to be absorbed, which reduced the development of bacteria, and therefore there wasn't the, uh, the obnoxious odors. Ed, can you help us out? Kay is so thrilled with Ed's product, she's back the next day for more. And she's brought friends. Ed's become the most popular guy on the block. Well, this was Ed's eureka moment, knowing he had a product that he could provide a use for that no one else had done. Ed knows his product works. Now he's got to sell it. He packs five pound bags of Fuller's Earth, comes up with a snappy brand name, and hits the road to flog kitty litter at cat shows and pet stores. He actually toured the entire United States with this product in his car with a trailer behind it, going door to door. The response is often skeptical, sometimes downright catty. People laughed at him because of just the nature of the product. It was like, really, that's really what you do? But everyone who tries kitty litter comes back for more. So Ed the entrepreneur takes a leap and buys a Fuller's Earth processing plant. Soon, he's exporting kitty litter all around the world. Consumers were knocking on the door for this product because it deodorized, it was efficient, and now their cats could be inside. Hi, I'm Ed Lowe. Since I invented cat box filler in 1947, I've been improving it ever since. Today, the cat box filler industry is a billion dollars in global sales. Ed Lowe is responsible for bringing the cat out of the cold and inside our households with the use of Fuller's Earth as a cat box filler. And Ed Lowe, the rags to riches inventor, becomes wealthier than he'd ever dreamed possible. Other brainwaves of the 1940s. 1948, a robot that can find its own way, guided by a photoelectric cell that navigates around obstacles. A step forward for artificial intelligence. 1944, motor-powered roller skates. The British inventor spends 20 years trying to keep his idea rolling forward. Tom, skate is a hold up just to show how fast and steady his auto works. Brrr, they got me, kid. But it misses the mark and never gains momentum with the public. Blimey. The Frisbee does take off the brainchild of a World War II veteran. He calls it the Pluto Platter to cash in on America's fascination with UFOs. He'll break his neck, smash his face in, and take a death blow, all so we don't have to. But the crash test dummy wouldn't be saving lives today if it wasn't for a doctor who risked his own life again and again. The year is 1947, and Captain John Stapp is a doctor in the U.S. Air Force. It's a heady time. The brave new world of jet power has revolutionized flight. But it's taking a toll on the pilots. Too many of them are getting hurt or killed in crashes. This is the era of supersonic jet-powered aircraft. That brings with it a whole host of, of problems. You can no longer just jump out of an aircraft with a parachute and, uh, and hope to survive. Stapp's bosses know that if America wants to rule the sky, they'll have to make jet flight safer. The Air Force launches a project codenamed MX-981, a groundbreaking study in crash survival. 
Dr. Stapp is assigned to head it up. His bosses think he has the right stuff for this kind of research. A medical degree, a PhD in biophysics, and an instinct to solve problems. He took it upon himself to do everything he could to figure out how do we, uh, uh, how can we save lives? Can, can we do it through equipment? Uh, can we see how much uh, acceleration a man can stand? What do we need to do? Stapp needs to find out when a pilot is ejected in a crash, what kills him? Extreme G-forces or design flaws in the safety gear? In 1947, conventional wisdom says the maximum G-force a human body can stand is 18 times your own body weight. 18 Gs was the limit of what they thought at the time was uh, what you could survive when in a crash. So you would might black out under that, but uh, you should your body should at least be able to take that much without dying. Stapp suspects the limit is higher than 18 Gs, but it will take death-defying research to prove it. He'll use a rocket-propelled sled to simulate a jet flying at various speeds. It has a powerful hydraulic braking system built to mimic different levels of G-force. The contraption is nicknamed the G-Wiz. The rocket sled's first test pilot, a primitive dummy made of sand, 185 pounds, the weight of a real pilot. So he actually kind of looks like a person. He's got some joints. Um, he's, he's hard. Um, he weighs 185 pounds. And uh, he, you know, he's got uh, something that looks like a face. But really, he, and in fact, he looks more like the Tin Man from the, the Wizard of Oz, something like that. Stapp uses the dummy to test the safety harness and braking system. But a flight suit filled with sand cannot show how a human body will react to G-force. And the dummy tends to lose his head in all the excitement. There's only one way to get accurate G-force data. And that's with a real live body. The first volunteer to strap himself into the rocket sled is John Stapp himself. He wasn't willing to kind of take half measures, and so when he decided that he needed to find out the truth about something, he did it uh, to the very best of his abilities, everything else be damned. Uh, it wasn't that he wanted the glory or he wanted to set records himself, it was that he felt it was his responsibility as the person in charge and as a doctor that he should take the biggest risks himself. Over the next year, Dr. Stapp takes 16 rides in the rocket sled ever-increasing speed. He would actually be nervous ahead of time. Uh, some stories say that uh, he got so nervous eventually that he would throw up before these rides. So he wasn't really uh, looking forward to it, and again, it suggests that perhaps he wasn't really doing it for the thrill, but for the, uh, the medical knowledge he could get from it. Dr. Stapp subjects himself to greater and greater G-forces pushing past the accepted limit of 18 Gs. It's making his bosses very nervous. Even more so when the good doctor is carried off on a stretcher after testing. I think the line between obsession and uh, scientific objectivity for John Paul Stapp was a little blurry. That's not all that's blurry. Stapp is temporarily blinded. He also cracks his ribs, breaks his wrists, knocks out his fillings, and gets bruised from head to toe. The Air Force decides enough is enough. Captain! A lot of his bosses thought that maybe he was a, a little bit reckless or that he uh, didn't adhere to bureaucracy, which was certainly the case, but from their perspective, uh, he was taking a lot of unnecessary risks. Stapp is ordered to stop testing immediately, before he kills himself or someone else. If Stapp wants to continue his research, he only has to create a realistic facsimile for a human being, an innovation that will change transportation forever. 
You need a dummy that has a face that looks like a person, that has you know the chest build of a person, uh, that has arms and legs and things that can move so that they can uh, design the proper safety equipment to, uh, to protect real pilots. The first step, make a mold from the real thing. A pilot is plastered from head to toe to create an accurate, full-scale shell. The mold is wired with accelerometers, transducers, and gyros, instruments that measure how the body reacts when the rocket sled crashes to a stop. He would have things like accelerometers to see how fast they were going. He would have pressure transducers to see, for instance, how much pressure was on the neck as it snapped forward. Um, they also had, uh, he also had a, a clavicle bone that was breakable so they could see if, uh, if during these, these abrupt stops if it, if it would break your, your collarbone. The world's first fully instrumented crash test dummy, nicknamed Sierra Sam, is ready for action. He needs a little bit of help getting to the test site. But all that matters is how he performs once strapped in to the Gee Whiz rocket sled. Stapp's dummy is subjected to crashes of greater and greater force. Eventually, his instruments prove once and for all, it's not G-forces that are killing people in crashes. It's poor safety equipment. What he proves is that people can, are a lot more durable than what we thought we are. So if we give them proper safety equipment, they can survive uh, almost any kind of crash as, as long as the airplane itself can survive. Sierra Sam enables Stapp to push testing to a whole new level, kickstarting a revolution in safety standards for jet aircraft. But Stapp's already thinking bigger. He realizes far more lives can be saved if the dummy can also safety test automobiles. So what he does is stage the first ever series of crash tests using vehicles. They requisition a bunch of, of junker cars from a junkyard, put these dummies in them, and then start crashing them into walls. Stapp finds that bumpers of the 40s add nothing to car safety. Seats dislodge too easily on impact. Dashboards are too close to the driver. And most importantly, seat belts save lives. The findings turned Stapp into a crusader. Without Stapp's work, there was really no interest in safety equipment for cars. So it was up to him and his missionary zeal to, to really push that on to the automotive industry and to demonstrate first to the Air Force and then to the car manufacturers that people can be saved through this type of safety equipment. He spends years lobbying the U.S. government to create tough new car safety rules. To when President Johnson signed the bill mandating the incorporation of lap belts into cars, it's John Paul Stapp who's in the room with him. Anytime you get in a car accident and, uh, and you're, you're safe and sound, you've got John Paul Stapp to thank. And so ends the war-torn 40s in what was the most inventive century the world has ever known.